Talking about the uh, Republican Party and its in its vision of the West after the Civil War, and what uh, basically what what do you think that what what is it that the Republicans want to do? They do want to industrialize, but on uh, they want to expand. So I want on. Um, so what, when we talk about this today, I want you to kind of because uh, they kind of downplay it. Um, but when you think of uh, what we're going to talk about today, the Homestead Act, you have to realize that it's a law that is meant to help encourage settlement. And so, therefore, if you're encouraging settlement. What also, what other policy is it? Uh, yeah, it's Indian. Okay, so we have a tendency to think of Andy Jackson as Mr. Uh, um, Indian removal guy. He is not alone as far as American uh, presidents are concerned. It is pretty much the policy of the United States government to move American Indians out of the way, no matter basically whoever was president. Okay. So, one of the goals of the Republicans was to incorporate the West into the country. And when we talk about the West, think of it like this. This was kind of the United States. This is where people had settled. People had also settled here. But there's this whole big chunk in the middle that was still empty. Okay. In other words, where 
the United States white Americans live, the United States where white Americans live, we're not connected. The Republicans want to connect them. That is what they want to do. So, the Republicans are going to do this by basically making um, uh, kind of a secondary thing in, in their policy. They're very much into industrialization, encouraging industrialization, particularly during the war. But another thing that they wanted to encourage was farming, which, by the way, is also good for you in a war, because what do you need for your army? You need food. And so um, in 1862, the uh, Republicans are going to establish the Department of Agriculture, okay, Ag, okay, Department of Agriculture, and this was meant to basically encourage farming. Um, going back to kind of that uh, that old Republican idea, uh, to remember the old Republicans and the uh, the idea of yeoman farmers, the citizen farmer. Well, that is also kind of the new Republican. They want to encourage small farm farmers, farmers to own the land. They further encourage this by passing what was known as the Homestead Act. What the Homestead Act did is it allowed you as a settler to acquire 160 acres of land. And all you need to do, all you need to do to get this land was pay a filing fee of $30, which was, which was kind of a lot of money at that time, but not for this amount of land. And, and, for five years, you have to live on this land. You have to improve it by putting some sort of dwelling or something like that on it. And then after five years, this land is yours free and clear. It is a policy which is meant to encourage you to move there. I want you to move west, here have land. I want you to move west, here have land. I want you to move west, here have land. And again, just make sure you're, you're getting this. On um, most of this land that they're giving away would have been land that would have been territory or property of American Indians before the government was giving it away. The other thing that the uh, Republicans want to do is they want to uh, encourage kind of education among the people that move west. Because remember, almost kind of like those old Republicans, citizen farmers, okay? One part of being a citizen farmer is you're the landholder. The other part is you have to have an education because you want to be able to make educated decisions when you vote. And so the, uh, the Morale Act, um, will set aside 140 million acres of land. And when they'll, what they'll do is they will sell that land. And when they sell that land, the money they gain from the sales will be used to establish public universities in the West so that there is, in effect, higher education in the West. We sometimes call them land-grant colleges which were A, meant to broaden education opportunities. But a lot of these land-grant colleges would be like my alma mater, Cal Poly. They'd be polytechnics. And they, uh, what they were designed to do is um, improve uh, um, American uh, technical and scientific expertise, particularly regarding land use particularly regarding land use. So in a lot of these polytechnics, you're going to have very strong agriculture departments, okay, uh, uh, studying how to use, how to farm land better. So 
is it, does everyone have any kind of a vision here of what, uh, of what the, uh, of kind of what the Republicans are encouraging, what they want? They want you to move west, which means that somebody else is moving out of your way. Uh, they um, want you to be the good citizen farmer, okay? We want to make sure that the land use is, you know, if you're educated farmer and you vote, good American citizens. Got it? Kind of what I just said. Oh, that word interior. Um, that's kind of an oldie word that we use for, if you think about it, it almost works out perfectly. This is uh, the United States up until this point. This is uh, the rest of the United States. This section of the country is kind of sometimes known as the interior of the United States. In the uh, cabinet today, there is what is known as the Department of the Interior. And what is the Department of the Interior in charge of? Public lands. So all, all the lands that are still owned by the government, the park system, any uh, wilderness area owned by the United States government is under the control of the Department of the Interior. So we have this Homestead Act, right? We are saying, hey, here is land go farm it. But many Americans kind of looked at where the land was and they said, uh-uh, I don't want to move there. And the reason why is that this section of the country was sometimes called the Great American Desert. It was a very arid region, a very dry region. And people basically thought, I don't want to farm there because it's going to be hard. Turns out that there was a weird lucky thing that happened in the first 10 years of the Homestead Act. In the first 10 years of the Homestead Act, there was an unusually wet era for this section of the country. And so as people moved, to this area, they, um, they found that it wasn't as dry as they had been led to believe. Um, people would actually start writing articles saying that the reason why it was not as dry was because people moved there. That in effect, pe the plows brought the rain. They, they would actually say things like this. They, uh, they believed that the fact that Americans were moving there was making it so that it was a less arid area. Turns out, we now know it was a very brief, short period of time, which has not really been repeated since. Okay? Uh, it, it just happened that at this time period, it was just a little bit wetter than it ever had been. The other thing that, um, that uh, people on the Great Plains found is that the soil in the Great Plains is actually really, really, really good. Uh, that with new tools like steel plows, once you got under the prairie grasses, once you dug up those prairie grasses, the soil down below, really good for growing things. And so many farmers became adept at what was known as dry farming, where if you plant really, really deep, Okay, you can actually grow a, a, a pretty good crop. So, stories start to develop. We get a, an era that is sometimes known as American fever, where people in Europe will hear about easily available land here in the United States. You could get that land either A, via the Homestead Act, or remember that um, to build the railroads, the railroads had been given a lot of land. What the railroads would actually do is offer packages in which they would say, hey, 
buy a ticket to the United States, we'll throw in the land. And so they were basically, you'd buy um, a railroad operated steamship ticket, uh, you would then write, uh, buy a ticket on the railroad, and then you would buy um, land, all from the railroad. Okay, and, uh, and this was one of the ways that the railroads made money. It also worked to fill this section of America, particularly kind of the upper west, uh, places like the Dakotas, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, with people particularly from Northern Europe. If you, if you look at uh, many of the people that, that live there, uh, many, many, many of them come from uh, uh, kind of uh, Northern Europe ancestry. Um, you can even still trace it a little bit in the Northern American uh, uh, accent. Uh, some, some of the notes are, are fairly similar. Another thing that the West did as far as uh, uh, opportunities is um, kind of an exception to the rules. For the most part after the Civil War, um, freed African Americans, freedmen, had a tendency to stay pretty close to where they, uh, um, they had always lived. But there was some exception. One exception were people from Louisiana who decided that, um, that not only what, did they want kind of the, the freedom that you got just from being free from slavery, but they wanted kind of economic freedom as well. And what these people did is they are going to move particularly to western Kansas. And since there's kind of that image of getting out of slavery and into freedom, economic freedom, they, uh, they nickname these people the Exodusters, basically kind of the biblical limit, the image of the Exodus, getting out of, uh, out of slavery to freedom, okay, uh, it is, is the nickname they give for, the, uh, for these people. Yeah? So the Homestead Act wasn't limited to just white males? Like so, um, um, not necessarily. Okay. So could American, um, American Indians claim the land? Not. They weren't citizens. Right. So, um, but that would be an interesting term. Here, here, here's the reason why it didn't, it wouldn't quite work, is because, on um, as we're going to find later with the with the Dawes Act, is. Um, American Indians didn't think of land as individual ownership thing. They thought of it as collective group thing. And that was one of the conflicts and one of the reasons why there's conflict between the United States and American Indians. Another group, okay, that benefited from the Homestead Act were women. Depending on where you went, Anywhere from five to fifty, uh, five to twenty percent of the homestead claims were actually made by women. Um, women, it, it turned out, would uh, there there was much more equity in the West, um, as you didn't have so much the the new society, the new factory guided society in the West. You had more. If you uh, you just needed everybody to chip in type of attitude, so so there was m uh, much more uh, equality for women in the West. Um, this was uh, uh, shown because it would be in the Western states um, that women will be given the right to vote first. Um, Utah, Wyoming, Wisconsin. These would be the first states to give women the right to vote. Remember, when we get to the 19th Amendment, which uh, gives women the right to vote nationally, what that law or what that amendment does is it basically says that no state can prevent women from voting. There were states that by that time had already given women the right to vote, if that makes sense. The Homestead Act, however, 
turned out to be almost more of a cruel joke than an awesome uh, gift of land. The amount of land that was granted in the Homestead Act, 160 acres, anywhere else in the United States, this would have been enough land easily for a, a, uh, a family to survive off of. Not so much on the Great Plains. As we start to figure out the early years of the Homestead Act, those first couple of years where it was kind of wet, well, that was the exception. The rule was it was really dry. And in order to survive, you couldn't make it on 160 acres. You needed more like 300 to make up for any sort of environmental uh, problems you have to some of your land. Uh, you, you don't grow as much, so you grow. You need more land to grow things on in order to survive. It also turns out that the, uh, the environment on the Great Plains is not very kind to people. That you could be sitting there with an awesome crop, you're sitting on your porch, you're all proud of the fabulous uh, um, crop that you're about to bring in, and all of a sudden a swarm of locusts wipes you out. Um, a, uh, a prairie fire erupts from a bolt of lightning. A, uh, um, a hailstorm rains down and just ruins everything that you have, you have planted. You could go from hero to zero in nothing flat. And if that happens to you in consecutive years, you're done. So the farmers on the Great Plains, if they survive many years, guess what they're kind of thinking? They think they are all that. If you manage to, to, to survive and you saw all your neighbors go under, you kind of think that you, well, you must be good. Uh, people started to consider themselves as nature's conquerors. That they, that they were thrown into this uh, inhospitable world, and they won. What turned out to be more of a rule is that individual farmers kept failing. And in place of individual farmers, big corporate farms would take their place. The big corporate farms, oftentimes working in accordance with the government uh, building uh, uh, irrigation, these turned out to be the way that the Great Plains could be farmed. These big farms, in effect, became the breadbasket to the United States, the, the big producer of grain and food to the world, not the small farms the way the Republicans had envisioned. For the most part, Farming on the driest parts of the plains turned out to be kind of a miscalculation by the United States government. The United States government had thought that the way to fill the West was by offering out little, plant, uh, little plots of land and then you make a whole bunch of citizen farmers just like Jefferson would have liked. But instead what was successful, big farms oftentimes run by corporations. John Wesley Powell, who was from the U.S. Geological Survey, thought that the only way really for farming to continue on the Great Plains was through U.S. government irrigation projects, okay, on um, not homesteads. And so what had become kind of a trend in the West 
is that usually things would start small. Like think uh, the first people who uh, strike gold. Some small little minor 49er. But in order to get the real gold, it took a corporation with heavy equipment. Same thing ends up being true in the Great Plains as far as farming. Starts off, we're trying to bring in little farmers. But what ends up being the, the more successful thing in the end? Large scale farming corporate operations. Yes. Yeah. And so the corporations would come in after the yes. dead failed. Okay. When you, so you fail. Yeah. I'm your land is uh, so your your land you own it now. Right. But you have to sell it cheap. Okay. And, and then I buy it cheap. And then since I own lots of it, and then I might work cooperatively with the federal government to bring in irrigation, mm -hmm. I can make it successful. But I highly don't understand though because. Fires still happen. They still do, yeah. but um, but on a larger scale mm -hmm. operation, is it going to be yeah. as? Is, yeah, okay. you, it's not just one farm you're wiped out. Right. That might be one section. Also, if you're keeping it wetter because you have irrigation, are you as susceptible to uh, to the prairie fires? Is the prairie fires? And then finally. Which lands do you think the large corporations end up with? Do they end up with the more marginal land that it keeps getting destroyed or the more uh, valuable land eventually? Interestingly enough, the Republicans and their ideas became very successful. They had started to encourage so many people to move into this section of the country that now they are thinking, wait a minute, maybe we are going to destroy everything. Maybe we are going to overdevelop the West. And so, in the 1870s, the government begins a policy of setting aside land for national parks. Land to not, to not be used, as opposed to be used. The, um, the first, first national park was created by Ulysses Grant. It was Yellowstone in 1872. But even this policy had something that is kind of negative about it. And the downside of this policy is that preservation sometimes meant eviction. Because if I'm trying to preserve the land and keep it pristine and natural, what if American Indians are living on that land? And the United States government would use the formation of a national park, first principally Yellowstone, as an excuse for moving American Indians yet again. So in a uh, second period, someone kind of pointed out that uh, it was first American Indians are being moved out of the way because they weren't developing the land. Now they are being moved out of the way because they don't want the land developed. An example here was the United States government uh, moving the Nez Perce Nation under uh, Chief Joseph in 1877. And kind of my last point on um, maybe not just to do with the national park, but with the entire um, uh, Western policy of the of the Republicans at this time, 
is that basically um, the United States government's policy at this time in effect becomes not just settling the West, but unsettling by uh, Native people who already lived there. That in order for you to have the Homestead Act, you had to move the people out of the way. In order to have the national parks, you had to move the people out of the way. In order to have the uh, cattle ranches, you had to move people out of the way. The common theme is they had to move the people out of the way. All right. So, pick three things to, to try, try and hold on to. So, on uh, just kind of think of this Western settlement and the policies. Uh, what are three things that um, you, you kind of want to hold on to here? Um, what are three things we should try and remember here? Why don't you turn to um, your White House and share?
That should have been in. Gave 160 acres of land to anyone with $30. The first 10 years were unusually rainy, which attracted many people and then proved to be fatally dry. And the Morale Act set aside land for public universities. Nice. Okay. Um, Zoe. Um, I said the Republican ideal successful small farmers in the West soon declined due to environmental factors and the dominance of large corporate farms. So it looks like you guys kind of got the, uh, the gist of this. So we all need to take a stretch for a moment, everyone just kind of stretch up to the ceiling. Too big. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he's a good giraffe. <laughs> the last part of the period, I kind of want to dedicate to what had to be done in order for the set, uh, the Homestead Act, the creation of the national parks. Uh, mining, uh, um, cattle ranching, what in effect had to be done for all of those uh, settlers to be able to have the land that they settled in. So I want to start with a series of four quotes. You, all you need to do is kind of read them if you want to write some sort of note as to what they were about real quick. Um, but you don't need to write down the whole quote. But they're going to kind of set up the attitudes of the time.
take a quick look at this date here. And now here's the same person 10 years later, or almost 10 years later. way of saying oops. <laughs> Philip Sheridan, um, as we're going to find out, is the general that um, President Grant puts in charge of implementing his policy toward American Indians. And so now just one more time. That's the person he put in charge of implementing this peaceful policy for American Indians. <laughs> Got it. So, basically, what a, um, we're, we're going to do kind of a change over time thing here. And I'm going to give uh, a couple different stories of. Um, uh, things that happened during what is about a quarter century war between the uh, United States government and American Indians on the Great Plains. So, at the beginning of this quarter century, prior to the Civil War, the policy of the United States government was to move American Indians to American Indian territory and Andy Jackson had designated all of the Great Plains as permanent American Indian territory. So this uh, part of his, what he claimed to be his uh, idea with American Indians was that um, they would be moved from uh, the east side of Mississippi to the west side of Mississippi. Uh, Oklahoma was to be permanent American Indian territory as was the Great Plains, okay? All of that was supposed to be American Indian territory permanently. But after the Civil War, settlers are going to flood into the Great Plains, largely driven by Abraham Lincoln and the Republicans' homestead. Um, this encouraging of people to move westward. And by 1890, that area is carved into territories. What that means is that they had, by 1890, they had um, basically taken the west and created things which would soon become states. In 1893, the superintendent of the census will say that the American frontier is now closed, that there is no true frontier anymore in the United States, because it has all been settled. As people moved into this West, they will bring with them disease. And this is kind of step one. It, it's kind of the unintentional part of the war. Remember way back when we talked about the French. We talked about how the French had um, moved throughout the um, interior part of North America and had spread disease and had killed off many American Indian nations. But there was one nation that was largely immune to that, what happened with the French. And that was the Sioux. The reason why the Sioux survived when so many other peoples died was that they lived, uh, had a tendency not to live in big uh, villages, large clutches of people. They had a tendency to be more nomadic, more spread out from one another. And so therefore, they basically didn't uh, experience the huge die-off. But, 
since they survived, guess what people then populated the plants? The soot. And so now when the Americans move into the plains, who are the people that they are now meeting up with? The soot. And so who are they going to be the people who get the diseases and die? The soup. Got it? Americans will also bring with them livestock. Um, cattle, uh, sheep, goats. And th this livestock had a tendency to eat down uh, the grasses and the plants. Uh, causing uh, the, um, the, the bison that, that lived there to basically not have a large enough food supply. And their numbers will start to dwindle. Additionally, the, uh, um, the bison population will be whittled down by American hunters that would be just uh, killing them because of their hides oftentimes leaving their carcasses behind, not even using the meat. Additionally, um, there were even instances where uh, if a, um, a railroad train happened upon a herd of buffalo, and that herd of buffalo being so large might be in the way of the train making passage, what they oftentimes would do is simply hand out um, rifles to everyone on board the train, and they would just simply shoot out the windows killing as many bison as possible. Clear the track, the train moves on, and you just leave the carcasses behind. And so what was a major food supply for American Indians is killed off, and the plains soon fill with the food supply for Americans in the east, cattle. Via treaty, American Indians start giving up their lands in exchange for promises. The promises were usually A, leave us alone. B, well, if you were a, a, a people that is used to hunting and gathering with large space with large numbers of, of bison, and that is no longer available. What the United States government is going to do to kind of encourage you to give up some of your, uh, the land you claim is basically to promise to feed you, to supply you, to give you food, to give you the clothing, and so therefore you don't need to go off and hunt together because the government is going to take care of it. So just sign on the dotted line, and it'll all be okay. Just give up some land, and the government's going to be, it's going to all be good. And so, in exchange for these promises, American Indians start giving up more and more and more of their land. When the Grant administration comes into office, they are going to find that American Indian policy is in complete disarray. Um, the obviously, the Johnson administration, there was not a large focus uh, with that. Um, uh, even Hayes, there was not a, uh, a, a great deal of um, uh, um, effort being put toward what the United States government as a whole policy toward American Indians is. So when the Grant administration comes in, largely feeling the pressure of reformists, reform groups, um, President um, Grant will say that we need to implement a peaceful policy toward American Indians. We need to do this better. We need to, um, we need to have a good relationship. He then took his we need to have a good relationship policy and hands it over to the United States military to enforce it. Philip, the only good Indian is a dead Indian Sheridan. 
I would like you to implement my peaceful policy. William Tecumseh, don't let my middle name fool you. I'll destroy everything in my path. Sherman, I want you to implement my peaceful policy. They don't. They don't do it peacefully. And Grant, who has a lot of things which he, which connected with his name, which are well-intentioned, he was not a good, strong leader as far as being a president was concerned. There was a great deal of corruption in his administration, a great lack of leadership in his administration, and Sheridan and Sherman would pretty much do whatever they wanted to do. Secondly, the other people in charge of implementing the policy were known as Federal Indian Agents, FIA. Now, um, do you guys remember, um, it was a while ago when we talked about, about Jackson, remember the spoil system? The spoil system still exists. It was still the way you rewarded your followers was by giving them jobs and positions in government. One of the most sought after government jobs during this era was federal Indian agent. Now it seems a little bit counterintuitive. Why would I want to be the federal Indian agent? Why would I want to go off to the West? Well, it turns out this was one of the most lucrative positions you could be in charge of. And the reason for it is that federal Indian agents were responsible for implementing the treaties. In, in other words, if the federal government promised that this much food, this much clothing, this much stuff to American Indians, it would be the federal Indian agent whose job it was to get that stuff to the American Indians. And so here you were, the federal Indian agent out in the West, and all this stuff's being sent to you. Well, who else is in the West? What's that? You are, but who else? American Indians, who else? What, 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 what is the Homestead Act bringing us? Europeans. Europeans, settlers, people, right? And they're out in the West, what do they need? What do they want? They want stuff, right? Are they willing to pay for the stuff? Yeah, they are. And so what federal Indian agents would, would do is they would take all of the goods and things like that that had been promised to American Indians and will sell them to the settlers in the West and get rich. They then, sometimes, would take their profits and use a little bit of it and buy on um, surplus Civil War tins of food. And they go out to the reservation and say, here's the food we promised. And basically leave these reservations starving. Yeah? Would you say that like most of the people that wanted to be the federal Indian agents were like bad people? Or were they like For the most part, a lot of people in government at that time, particularly during this time of the spoil system. And we're going to talk a little bit more th about this later. We're doing it for the money, for the reward. Um, the uh, president, when the, their first weeks in, actually for, uh, um, for many of their first couple years in office, the first, the, all they're going to do is fill federal jobs with people who feel that they have earned the right to some sort of government payroll job because they supported the party. And the, the federal Indian agents would be very much the same as, as those. Does that make sense? Eventually, even under the Grant administration, the United States is breaking treaties and openly taking Indian money. Because remember what happens in that, that Supreme Court case. It's okay. This is a political cartoon that kind of, that's, uh, this is how the uh, um, federal Indian agent was char characterized. And what does it say on his bags? Yeah. His job is supposed to, to supply food. Is he supposed to be making a profit out of it? Is that what the job is supposed to be? And so what, how was 
what, was, what remained with American Indians were that they were starving. This starvation is going to lead to reaction on the part of American Indians. And so going back a bit to the 1860s, in the 1860s, there was an uprising among the Dakota Sioux. The Dakota Sioux were starving due to the uh, corruption of the Minnesota territorial governor, who would be a federal, uh, a federal governor, um, and the federal Indian agents okay, in Minnesota at that time. They basically were denying uh, the Dakota Sioux the amount of food that they needed to survive. So, the Dakota Sioux started raiding countryside towns, and in those raids, we estimate that some 400 people were killed. Do you think this is going to get the, uh, the attention of the United States government, that, uh, that uh, 400 frontier whites are being killed by American Indians? You betcha. And so the um, the military will go out, round up the Dakota Sioux. They will hold a military tribunal, and this military tribunal will uh, determine that 307 Dakota Sioux needed to be executed for these crimes. The President Lincoln, because remember this is Lincoln's term here, President Lincoln will look at the results of this tribunal. And he will overturn all but 38 of these death sentences. Now, by the way, this is something that um, Abraham Lincoln had to do a lot, uh, not only dealing here with American Indians, but during the Civil War. One of the biggest crimes that you can do as a soldier. What's one of the biggest crimes you can do as a soldier? Desert. Leave. Yeah. The, the punishment for desertion is death. And so every deserter that had been caught had been given a death sentence. And Abraham Lincoln basically spent a huge amount of his time during the Civil War overturning death sentences for American soldiers that had been sentenced to, to die. So this would have been very much a similar thing. Okay? That, um, and in this case, uh, Lincoln overturns all but 38, which to me, he's probably overturning the ones where, well, you were there. And instead, what gets upheld, we saw you do it. Even with the 38, though, they will execute these 38 people simultaneously. This is the biggest mass execution in American history, where they basically have 38 gallows, 38 hanging ropes, okay, all simultaneously. The Dakota Uprising, however, kind of set a tone that um, for the next couple of years during the, uh, during the Civil War, the United States Army became the large, you know, this huge, giant, giant, giant army as, uh, as thousands and thousands of soldiers are either going to volunteer or be drafted into the United States military. Well, one of the things that isn't realized so much um, by American students of history is that while we are building up the United States Army to fight the Civil War in the South, we are also building up the United States Army for its war against American Indians in the West. These two things are happening at exactly the same time. The attitude of many of the American soldiers in the West was one that was kind of painted by the fact that the Dakota uprising, that so many whites were killed. And so they basically had kind of a vengeance attitude about them. Anyway, we see kind of the results of this. 
1864. In 1864, the Cheyenne had been forced to a reservation known as Sand Creek. They too will find themselves under supply and will start raiding off of their reservation looking for food. So, a territorial militia is sent in to round up the Cheyenne. They end up surrendering and placing themselves actually under federal protection, under the protection of the United States government, um, near an American fort known as Fort Lyon. Now this encampment, I want you to all have a picture in your mind. These people had surrendered. So they were flying surrender flags, white flags. They also had a tendency to fly American flags because uh, this is the Civil War and they were trying to basically show that they were loyal to the United States, the Union, during the Civil War. So if you were at this fort, you would look out and you would see this encampment of American Indians with white flags, American flags, all flying. The head of the militia was a general by the name of S.R. Curtis. And he is going to send a telegram to the militia colonel who had rounded up the, uh, um, the, this group of Cheyenne. And in this telegram, he's going to say, I want no peace until the Indians suffer more. And so here you are, okay, you're, you're, you, have your, you have your militia unit, you have your soldiers. The Cheyenne are encamped in basically right next to a, a United States federal fort. They are flying white flags, they are flying American flags. But your commander just said to you, I want no peace until the Indians suffer more. So what's a poor colonel to do? But attack. And so he rides in source, uh, swords, guns, bayonets, and attacks this encampment. Some 500 people were in this camp. Some 200 of them will be killed. The main people to be killed would be people that are not fast enough to run away. And the main people that weren't fast enough to run away were children and moms trying to take care of their kids. Happy 150th anniversary. Second example I want to give you here is I'm going to go back and talk about the Sioux and then, and then kind of paint a kind of paint a picture for you. So the Sioux. had territory up here. American settlers wanted to go across Sioux territory to get to places like Washington and Oregon. Okay, so you, so, so you kind of have that on your map. Uh, this is where people want to go. This is where people live. They have to go through Sioux territory here. The United States government is going to try and help. Remember, the, that settlement is a thing that the United States government was encouraging at this time. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers 
was building a settlement trail. It was known as the Bozeman Trail. Okay. The United States Army Corps of Engineers was building a settlement trail known as the Bozeman Trail. And as the um, U.S. Army is building this trail, we get a little bit of that, that phenomena known as, if you build it, they will come. And, and, and what I mean by this is like you're building a thoroughfare. What has a tendency to develop along thoroughfares? What's that? Roads, settlements. You, people basically are kind of attracted to being along the road because you can make money. Uh, you know, roads usually bring people, right? And so people start settling along the road. Which, where are they settling then? They're settling in Sioux territory. So a Sioux leader by the name of Red Cloud is going to appeal to the United States government. He's going to uh, say that the United States is violating, okay, uh, Sioux land, Sioux territory. And the response of the United States government is to continue to build the trail. So a second Sioux leader by the name of Crazy Horse is going to ambush an American unit under the command of William J. Fetterman. This gets the attention of the United States government. All of a sudden, they're now willing to talk. They meet with the Sioux and they signed what is known as the Treaty of Fort Laramie. In this treaty, the United States government agrees to close the Bozeman Trail, meaning it's no longer a settlement, it's no longer a thoroughfare, so therefore it's not going to be a draw for settlement anymore. But, in order to get this agreement, in order to make it so that this, this, this road disappears and is no longer a draw for American settlers, the Sioux have to give up more of their land. They have to basically confine themselves to, a, it was a large, but a large on reservation. When the land was divided up, the United States was kind of taking what would have been the more valuable farmland. They basically were carving out of the Sioux territory places where people could move. They had given the Sioux the more marginal land or reserved to the Sioux, the more marginal land. But in the more marginal land was an area known as the Black Hills. And what do you think we found? Gold. Gold is discovered in the territory that was reserved for the Sioux. So naturally, what was the approach of the United States government? Well, want it. And the United States government attempts to now buy another chunk of land away from the Sioux. The Sioux say no, and they actually work to defend that land. They will engage in a battle with the United States, a battle known as the Battle of Rosebud Creek. So, the United States will send a well-known I guess the best way to put it is Indian killer. A leader by the name of George Armstrong Custer is sent in to hunt down the Sioux Army. Custer will arrive with a unit of some 500 men. 
But he believes that A, his troops are so well armed and well trained, he does not need as many with him at once. And he wants to locate the Sioux army quickly. So what he does is he splits his unit up into three columns. So he had 500. Now divide it basically up into three. One third, one third, one third. He will then discover a Sioux army which we estimate numbered about two to three thousand. He has one third of his forces. And so naturally what does he do? He attacks. It does not go well for him. Custer's unit, at least that one third of it, will be killed, we believe, to the very last man. And there are some cool things, like if, uh, um, if, you, if you're Mr. Klima's class, he's going to show you the movie Little Big Man, which was uh, uh, kind of a, a uh, fake biography of a scout that survived the, uh, the massacre. Um, but um, basically, Armstrong is killed, along with all of his men. The way that it gets portrayed in American legend, however, is that he was massacred. And basically what was left of his unit, okay, basically is now put in charge of, in effect, getting revenge. The, uh, the army will then take reprisal or start punishing all the Sioux in the area. Sitting Bull, who was one of the leaders, will try and take his group of Sioux across the border into Canada. But way, 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 way up norther than north, the food supply and the weather is not kind. And so, facing starvation, City Bull will return about five years later and surrender. Sitting Bull. Sitting Bull actually will later uh, join Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show. And he will actually, in the show, act out the uh, massacre of um, Custer as entertainment. So the policy that I have shown you thus far, is it very peaceful? Obviously not. And there were many, many, many people who believed that what the United States government was doing as far as killing American Indians was wrong. And we had to do something different. But different was not just leave them alone. Different was something known as assimilation. People believed that the only way that there can be peace between the Americans and the American Indians is if the American Indians gave up their beliefs and their culture, and became part of white culture. Assimilation, another word for it, 
acculturation. Assimilation or acculturation. Implementing this policy, uh, one example, were the Carlisle Indian Schools. And the Carlisle Indian Schools, the, um, the slogan, or the slogan for the, the Carlisle Indian Schools, kill the Indian and save the man. Kill the Indian and save the man. They would literally go to um, American Indian settlements, gather up the little kids, kids smaller than like my sons, and take them off to boarding schools and raise them in the traditional white culture of the day. Basically, people, everything they knew will be wiped out. If they meet their families later on, they're terrified of them because they are nothing like how they've been raised. To kill the Indian, save the man. The policy largely ends up being a failure. And one of the main reasons for writs, there obviously you can see many reasons for it, but one of the many reasons for it was that there were competing different reform agencies and groups that would all have their own view of what you needed to do. Oftentimes, they would be religious-based groups. And the problem is, is that you'd have different versions of religion competing with one another as to which religion people should ought to become. You can maybe imagine how messy that would become. American Indians start to notice that, 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 uh, that mixed messages are being sent. What, one, what one group said needed to be done was different than what another group said needed to be done. Obviously not making for a very good policy. But the biggest example of this assimilation policy happens in 1887. When the United States government passes the Dawes Severalty Act. Severalty, sever, cut. Severalty, sever, cut. They basically were looking to cut away American Indian beliefs. The Dawes Severalty Act will break up the reservations and distribute the land. The idea was that they were going to Americanize Native Americans, which just, I, you know, I, I, I kind of chuckle at my phraseology here. Americanize the American How they do it? Well, they're going to give every head of household in American Indian nations 160 acres to become a farmer or 320 acres to become a rancher. The idea is this. We don't want you to behave as a big group thing anymore. Group, bad. Individualism. America, you farm your own land. Become a good little farmer. That's what you should become here in America. Okay, so, so why we're... Is it an Irish I don't know. <laughs> anyway, okay, so, so basically, 
if everybody behaves as good little white farmers for 25 years, the United States would make them citizens of America. Be a good little white farmer for 25 years. And again, you can just kind of toy with that, that language, okay? Turns out that when they divided all of the land <coughs> up into 160-acre and 320-acre plots, they had land left over. In fact, they had about two-thirds of the land left over. And so, well, what's a poor government to do? You have all this spare land. What are you supposed to do with all the spare land? Well, sell it, of course. So, what, so once they basically gave you your plot of land and you could become a good American farming your land, the excess land is then divided up and sold. Interesting crumbs. Yeah. In 1924, the federal government decides, well, you know, maybe we should make all American Indians actually citizens of the United States. And they gave blanket citizenship to all American Indians in 1924. Now let's fast forward just a little bit. In 1934, the United States government kind of goes, oops. Maybe what we did before was not the best policy. And so during the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration, they are going to reverse the Dawes Severalty Act. They are going to pass what is known as the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, sometimes known as the Indian New Deal. We'll talk about what the New Deal is later. Um, what it did is it partially reversed assimilation by saying to American Indians that once again they can join together in groups. You can be a group again. I know we said that being a group was bad. Now you can be a group. Have fun. Regroup. And sorry about that. Oh, wait, no, they never said the sorry part. Of the All right. So, one last thing. We're running out of time. But here's the end. Okay? In 1890, the Sioux are going to face on reduced rations and increased restrictions because of the Dawes Severalty Act. It's at this point that a, a prophet from the Paiute Nation is going to say that he has a vision. And in his vision, he sees that all the, 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 uh, the um, um, native lands are going to be restored. But in order to do this, people needed to perform, okay, particularly here the Sioux, but people needed to perform the ghost dance. This dance spreads like wildfire through the Sioux Reservation. People on start performing this ritual. And the United States government starts to go, why are they doing this? Okay. Don't worry about that one. That, that's all you need. That's all you need. The United States government decides that the Sioux were planning an uprising. 
And so, they send federal police to go arrest Sitting Bull, the symbolic leader of all the Sioux. When the federal police arrive, Sitting Bull does not go quietly. One of his bodyguards shoots and kills a federal police officer. The police, along with the United States Army, will round up the remaining 350 Sioux in the area and bring them to a place known as Wounded Knee Creek. There, they will order them to give up their guns, and they kill. Pardon me. And when they don't, the soldiers will kill some three hundred. This is the symbolic end of a 25-year war against American Indians for the United States to be able to populate the interior of the United States. I will see you on Wednesday.